Testing, testing, one, two, three, testing. Testing, testing one, two, three. It's going too far. Yeah, he's picking it up. I'm just adjusting the volume. It's not supposed to go over in that region. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Okay. You know the convention passed a amendment to the bylaw setting up a, an executive council. Uh, I think they added the word advisory, uh, executive advisory council, which consisted of all the central labor union presidents. And we've got two or three pressing matters, uh, which I deemed necessary that we call them in. Uh, and I didn't call them and give them enough time, so all of them may not be here. But we made a late decision that it should be called in at this time because we need to help on two or three things. And so they are here and will participate in the, in the meeting and uh, try to learn about our program. We'll probably go into executive session somewhere this afternoon on down near the end of it here and they can be excused if they want to go home or if they want to stay tonight, that'll be their business. I'd like to ask if we can, if we're Ask Brother Jennings if he'll open the meeting with a word of invitation. All stand, please. Let him say, I'm standing on the We come this morning, dear Heavenly Father, faithful to the task you and put this life in front of us. To realize. Among ourselves, with your help, O Heavenly Father, that we can then be whole on the work of our faith. If we fail, O Heavenly Father, then those things that which we say to our people will be of naught. But we know, Heavenly Father, that if we walk hand in hand with you, with your help, and to help us remember that this is day to day, that we can put forth a program that will help the poor and the rich as well in this world. Heavenly Father, we are in a terrible thing, and so will come on all over the Certainly, not only the president of this organization, but the president of these United States. Certainly, the governor of this state, oh Heavenly Father, let them realize that nothing can be done unless they must be a part of it. And when we are finished here this afternoon, oh Heavenly Father, Help us and guide us safe in the hand of these and other blessings we ask in your same place. to having the Central Labor Union President with us today, we have three or four other guests that I'd like to introduce, and we'll hear from them sometime during the, the day. Uh, we've got about three, I think, that uh, 
or we're recuperating from the poker game, we'll probably be down a little bit later. Uh, we have with us over here on the far right, Jesse Lester. Jesse's a labor liaison for the Office of Economic Opportunity, OEO, out of Atlanta. Jesse's a packing house worker, and I've worked very well with him uh, in the Atlanta Central Labor Union for several years. Next to him, as all of you know, is our uh, public relations man, uh, Leonard Dudley. <coughs> And back there in the back next to the wall, I think all of you already know Clem Dollar. Clem was with the textile workers in Lakeville Spray Draper, joint board manager, and then went with the National Council of Senior Citizens. And then I resigned coat job. Clem was appointed the area coat director. And Clem's with us today as area coat director. Sitting the second one up here, most of you know Curtis Bullock. Which former president of Papermakers Local in Roanoke Rabbits and now an F of L CIO staff representative. Uh, our new secretary, which uh, many of you don't know, Miss Janice Crane, here on my left. I think everybody knows everybody else, but just in case there might be some CLU presidents here that don't know board members and vice versa, let's uh, start with you, Virgil. Tell your name and your position and your area. I'm Virgil Johnson, local 317 back of working Greensburg and president of Central Lake Union Go ahead, Johnson, and see your YouTube channel. I'm Debbie full vice president of the National Life Radio Network. I'm vice president of the United States of the Finance Secretary Local 1426, International Long Term Convention, North Carolina, Vice President of North Carolina City of Fort Worth. Dr. Carlton, General Secretary of the District of Fire, Friends of Workers, and Vice President of the State of Fort Worth. Bird, business page of local 250, Texas Workers Union of America, the vice president of the FLC. Mm -hmm. John Sestoa, according to the Secretary of Pine County Central Labor Union, account chief for local 270, United Dollar mm -hmm. Workers, and vice president. John Russell Meek, Country Union, vice president of the FLC. Red Phillips, first vice president of the FLCO, business manager of the EW Local 495, or <coughs> Wilmington, North Carolina. <laughs> Harold Long, president of the United Rubber Workers, Local 277, state vice president. I know some of you feel that wasn't necessary, but there were three or four around here that I thought might not know. You might not know, and they might not know you. We even did this. I'd like to say, uh, Ms. Crane, I believe I saw you writing down the names. You almost took the road, did you, at that yes, time? Yes, everybody that's present. Uh, I'd like to say I had a letter from Aubrey Dixon, and he notified me that he couldn't be present here because his international union was having a meeting, a regional meeting, and he was uh, compelled to be there. Also, yesterday afternoon, I had a call from Vernell Yarbor, who said that she wouldn't be down last night, and she wouldn't be able to stay tonight. So we had a Christmas party last night, and it was somebody's 
in her local very thick, uh, that she would try to get here for the board meeting today, and she may be in a little bit later. Uh, that's all the board members that I know Jim about. Pierce. Jim, Jim Pierce, uh, I talked to him. He was over in Chapel Hill uh, working on the problem of putting all these people back to work after the strike over there. He told me he would try to get in here today, and there was also another uh, meeting today that he wanted to be at, but that he would do his best to be here for last night and for the meeting today. I haven't heard any more from him, so I assume that we'll probably hear from him sometime during the day. Is that all that I know of? The board members, I think. All right. Uh, put out a bell pad here, Jim. Did you move it? No, I didn't. I got that in your little folder, in your little folder that's in front of you here, we have an agenda of the meeting today. If there are any guests or any board member that might want to try to rearrange some of this, I hope that all of you will be able to stay with us the entire day. I have called a, a meeting of some of our friends uh, in the liberal community and in the black community for this afternoon. Uh, the elected black officials in the state are meeting here today, and they'll be over about 3.30. As you know, we had a coalition meeting in Winston-Salem, and uh, are trying to move towards a coalition of the black the labor movement and the liberals in the state in order to we might get our legislative program through both the National Congress and the state legislature. I served also, been serving on the Governor's Commission, and uh, three weeks ago we had the hearing here in Raleigh, and there was an awful good group of those liberals present testifying before the Democratic Study Commission, and so I called them together well, I invited them to lunch with us, Jim Pierce and I. I don't know what it cost us because Jim picked up the tab and I'm supposed to reimburse him for half of it. But we had about 26 of the top liberals and blacks in the state present at this meeting. And uh, we talked about having another meeting and suggested we try to have it today. So outside of you people who I knew would be here today, we sent a communication to about 80 of those people that we'd have a meeting here this afternoon at uh, four o'clock and so if you can I'd like for all of you to plan to stay for that meeting because we've got some things that we need to discuss among ourselves and with these people in regards to the coming session of the legislature. <coughs> all right I guess the first order of business would be in your convention report which is in the, the, the yellow yellow or it might be blue. We've got two color covers because we didn't have enough paper. This is a report of the convention. It contains all the resolutions adopted by the convention. It contains all the constitutional amendments adopted by the convention. It contains a very brief synopsis of the convention on page one. And on page two is the board minute meeting of the board meeting held immediately following the convention. Uh, if you you want to read them or you want to glance over them, I think most of you have glanced over them. If they, you want the secretary to read them, we'll read them and then Mr. adopt them. Mr. Chairman, I move the adoption of the minutes of the convention as they're printed in our leaflet here. Vice President Phillips moves adoption of the September 5th, 1969 Executive Board meeting. Beginning second the motion. Second by Vice President Jennings. Discussion? Question. Any discussion, corrections, or additions? Hearing mm -hmm. none, the question has been called for. All in favor of the motion, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and so ordered. Mr. Chairman, on page two, there is one thing here I would like to call to all of our attention. January the 31st is coming up fast. And we have uh, given the unaffiliated local unions the opportunity to join with the state FLCIO without having to pay any back the capital tax 
If you'll notice the second last paragraph. And I think between now and January the 31st, we should put out an all-out effort to uh, make contact with these locals, uh, reminding them of this, call it a concession or where, whatever we may, uh, to the fact that now is the time for them to get in without having to uh, pay back any of the back capital as it's stated in the Constitution. I think we should put out an all-out effort to get the unaffiliated locals in with us before January 31st. Thank you. So I have a, a comment to make on that a little bit later in the meeting in another report. Now, also have been passed out in front of you here uh, the minutes of the Sunday meeting. All of these Saturday meeting, I keep thinking the convention ended on Saturday, but it ended on Friday. Uh, these are five pages long. You want them read or you want to, <coughs> most of you have been reading them while the latecomers were down. Are there any corrections or additions that anybody knows to these here? Move the adoption. Second. Vice President Russell moved the adoption of the executive board minutes of the Saturday, September the 6th meeting. Has anyone noticed any corrections or additions that need to be made? Vice President Long seconded. Any discussion? Question. Vice President Phillips called for the question. All in favor of the motion, let the norm saying aye. 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 Opposed no. Ayes have it and so ordered. On Saturday, uh, yeah, so that's, they was part of them were there Friday night, and then they had to leave, and then I've got what was there. All, right, all in favor of the motion, let me know. Say aye. Aye. Opposed no. Ayes have it, and so on. All right, the next uh, item on the agenda is activity report by Wilbur Hobby. The second one is activity report by James W. Hart. Uh, I was in a hurry making out the agenda here, and I just put down two. I think we can actually uh, say that when I report on the activity report, it'll be reporting for Jim and I both. We've been traveling as a team and working as a team and working well together. If Jim, uh, we decided we'd do this. If I leave anything out, Jim can uh, fill it in. I'll talk quite kind of fast on this because there's actually quite a bit that we've been doing, uh, uh, as you probably know. Uh, the first week after the convention, we went to Charlotte and addressed the Bill and Trades Rally at the Junior High School there in Charlotte. Uh, we worked with the Charlotte and State Bill and Trades, setting up the rally here in Raleigh. We came back to Raleigh and assisted in organizing and carrying out the Raleigh March against the CPNL. The following week, we went to Washington. We conferred with the department heads of the various departments within the AF of LCIO. We met with Director Al Barkin, and as a result, uh, uh, got $6,000 worth of funds for our registration drive. I think it's $6,500 or whatever. Uh, $6,500 for our registration drive. Uh, we conferred with the Education and Research Department, and they helped us set up the tax seminar and came down and helped us carry it out. From Washington, Jim stayed there and, and conferred another day. I flew to Newburn, where we had a local union on strike at the Atlantic Veneer Company. Local been on strike since July 28th. They were paying them the exact minimum wage of $1.60. I got in at, at 9 o'clock, addressed the church meeting in both at 30 miles away at 9.30 and we marched on the courthouse at 10 o'clock. Uh, from there, I came back to Raleigh and then went to the Bill and Trade Rally in Asheville. And the next item we had was the tax seminar in Durham, which I think uh, we didn't get quite the attendance that I hoped, but those who came, I think, learned a whole lot about the sales tax and we shown in the uh, <laughs> results of it later. We conducted marches in Winston-Salem, in which we had somewhere between 500 and 1,000 people. We marched in Asheville with about 2,000 people in the rain. We marched in Wilmington even after the tax was off, just protesting Carolina Power and Light and, and the uh, Brown and Root Company. We had somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 in Wilmington. So I consider the marches very satisfactory. 
Uh, we attended a meeting of the tobacco workers. Uh, International was holding a school in Charlotte. We went there, and then later on, I went to a meeting of the uh, 1800 member local in Reedsville. Went to Fedville with Curtis Bullock and uh, working on setting up the Central Labor Union in that area. Went to the National FL CIO Convention, Jim and I, and L.G. Holloman went up, and L.G. applied to Julius Rothman, the HRDI, which is the Human Resources Development Institute. Uh, it's a program on manpower funded by the Labor Department and sponsored by the FL CIO. And as a result, L.G. Holloman is now working full-time uh, for the FL CIO out of our office, and he has a full-time secretary who's doing about half of our work right now, assisting Ms. Crane in doing our work in the office over there. Uh, didn't think we'd get back in time to go to the Vance Acock. We sent four tickets to vice presidents who lived in that area. Uh, but we did get back in time and went to a CWA state president's meeting in Greensboro and from there to Vance Acock where we uh, participated. I've attended uh, CLU meetings in Rotterdam and Greensboro in the field of organizing. I uh, went to Winston-Salem and, and put out a leaflet with the state organization's name on it urging the people at the Splits plant to join the FLCO Brewer Workers Union and lost the election to the Teamsters. Uh, spoke to a meeting of Bill Holder with Secure Cable in Hickory, Jim and I did. Uh, gee, strike up that cause Bill to lose that one by five votes. Went to Holly Farms where they put two of John Russell's men in jail and dared them to put us in jail by 14 of us. They followed us all over the place, but uh, nobody went to jail. Uh, we also put this in the newspaper and uh, they called the mayor admitting he was following us all over town, but said he was just going through town. Uh, did uh, help the CWA by the, uh, printing some leaflets for two other campaigns they had. And by the way, CWA is doing a tremendous job in organizing, and uh, we're looking forward to some affiliations from them right soon in, in good numbers. Most of you know they last year won, or earlier this year, won a general, what is it, uh, East Carolina, 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 yeah. Uh, Charlotte, we made two meetings in Charlotte on organizing. The IUE had a meeting up there, uh, two meetings up there, and we went to both of those, and the photographers had got an organizing drive on, and we went up there and spoke to that group. On affiliation, uh, well, like, a, like a lot of people, we got a lot of promises but as yet, we haven't really had time. We're making a check so we can go through local by local. Uh, I can report that the, in Durham, the carpenters and the laborers are uh, affiliated. In Wilmington, we do have the carpenters in. I went to Statesville and spoke to an 800-member local of steel workers, and they got about five locals with about 1,800 people out. And they have voted to come in, but as yet, we haven't got the form in here. But the, Regional. We have received two from the steel workers already. Have got now got two of them. Okay. All the laborers through the state labor council will be affiliated no later than Monday. I've been assured this Monday. All right, and most of the building tradesmen have said that they're going to come in. John Jervis has been working with us on iron workers in uh, in Western North Carolina on steel workers, and they're coming in. And as you, you know, uh, that's probably what Jim's talking about. On the iron workers, no, I only have one on iron workers, but we got two new ones on steel workers. And then as you feel that, how many new cars? What are three? Yeah. We have steel three and three. nitrogen, steel and Franklin. Both also iron workers and nitrogen. Well, I've got the uh, iron workers in Nashville. Have you got sheet metal out of Charlotte yet? No. Yeah, that's right. Sheet metal out of Charlotte. I got them down here. I was going. 
Chief Man Well, John's helping us good in the western part. I want these other vice presidents and central labor union officers to help us as much. And John pointed out we have a representative here from the Inca local that we're trying to get back in. In Wilmington, we've made about three trips to Wilmington. Once down there, they weren't going to recognize the fact that the union workers built that new bridge they got down there, that elevated bridge. So we got a little publicity on it, and we went down there and sat on the front row just to let them know we were there. I also attended a, a state building trades meeting called in Wilmington. We went down last week, Red and I, and testified before a panel of the Atomic Energy Commission in regards to Carolina Power and Light building a nuclear reactor there at Southport. Uh, Jim and I and Arthur White, the research and ed education director, attended the Southern Labor School held in Jacksonville, Florida. We went to Washington and met with all the congressmen. Uh, and I won't say when I say all the congressmen, I mean just that. I think it was Red or somebody else told me when they had the bill and trade meeting, they wouldn't meet with us, so they didn't the two of them meet. We called them and set up and met with all the Democratic congressmen and Senator Irvin at a luncheon. Uh, we laid it on the line to them about our legislative program and how if they didn't support it, and we were going to remember them on election day. We bluffed our way into thinking, making them think we were going to do something. I'm going to call on you people to help us do it. Uh, then we met with the Republicans at 4 o'clock, and I'm telling you, they came out of Hammer and Tom. Uh, Jonas and uh, this guy Earl Ruth from Salisbury, I thought we were going to have to fight before we got out of there. Uh, they just really got on us. Congressman Broyhill finally got up and told Jones, he said, well, now, I hate to disagree with my colleagues on the minimum wage bill, but I'm for the increase in the minimum wage to $2, which was their FLCO position at the time, and still is. They're talking two fifty now, but by resolution, they're still on, on $2. <laughs> so uh, we did that. I met with the Appalachian Labor Council, which is 11 state FLCIO region last week in Washington. I've also had one meeting with them down here, two meetings, really. Uh, in that respect, and as I said, we had three men who were late because of up playing poker last night. Two of them have come in, Bob Matthews, the guy behind the big cigar back there, and Roger Bogus. Bob's out of Red's local IBW. Roger's out of CWA in uh, Winston-Salem. And uh, you two boys get the last two cigars. I'm a grandpa again, Roger. Uh, we're on the Governor's Study Commission. <laughs> We've been for the last six Saturdays hearing people all over the state on the Governor's Study Commission to revise the plans of the Democratic Party. And uh, we're going to get that done, I think. We also addressed here in this hotel the Young Democratic Club <laughs> Convention. And at that meeting, I laid it on the line that the, the Democratic Party could no longer expect to take labor and the Negro for granted. That we were working together closely, and we were going to be working together in the future. And if they didn't pay some heed to us, they were going to face the same thing that happened in the state of Virginia, where labor and the Negro support the Republican for governor. In a gallon. We conferred with the governor twice, and the subject of these meetings was the Industrial Commission, and I want to say I, I really appreciate the support I got from the people out here. I know that the governor received petitions with over 5,000 names on them that went into his office. Uh, when the petitions first started going in, he saw we were mounting a campaign, and I think in an effort to stop it, he appointed the man that he had in mind for this job immediately. Uh, but our petition kept rolling in. So we set up another meeting with him and went over there and talked with him. and told him we wanted to cooperate with him, but he really put us on the spot. We would had a man on this board ever since his inception. Uh, when they set the board up, they took the president of the state effort at the time and made him the chair, uh, member of the board. And he served for 20 years, 11 years of that as chairman. And then uh, his daddy appointed a railroad man, J.W. Bean, from Salisbury, and he served for 20 years, and now he's broken this. 
we considered going to court with this thing. But about that time, he made a couple of good statements on state, county, municipal employees. All the lawyers I told me told me I could win in the court of public opinion, but they didn't think I could win in court. So we went over and, and played real rough with the governor, and he said that he would allow us to name the next man who's coming up in two years. And I think under the circumstances, that's the best we can hope to get. So uh, we decided that we wouldn't blast the governor on this thing, that we would play along and see if we couldn't get the most we could out of him. And this was a decision we made. The other thing we talked to him about both times was giving a, finding a place for Mr. Barbie. And the uh, day before yesterday, I called the governor's office to find out because I understood Mr. Barbie wasn't yet at work. In fact, I think Troy Burrow told me he was vacationing down the Virgin Islands uh, last week. And so I called over there to find out what the status of this was. And he said that they had talked to him and given him an application to fill out he did never return the application. And they couldn't give him a job to fill out the application. So I wanted to have some something positive to tell the board, so that's where we stand on that matter. We, Jim and I, paid a, a visit on Frank Crane and told him that uh, we've been newly elected, we'd like to cooperate with his office in any way that we could, and uh, expected his cooperation in return. I don't know where we're getting it or not. So uh, Tom Poo, who's head of the Bureau of Friendship Training, and I sit down and talk about the men who ought to be on the statewide apprenticeship board. And they, I understood they were open, but there were a couple of men on this board that were supposed to be free labor men. All of the ones on there now, then had retired, and they weren't supposed to serve. So he said he got my letter late and he had already appointed. He appointed a uh, railroad man from Hamlet, a carpenter out of a Charlotte local, and Red Powell out of the Mark and the Back Company local, and Red retired too. Uh, our recommendations were uh, Cora Wilkerson for him plant training. He's out of glass bottle blowers in Henderson. Uh, Eugene Russ, the IBW business agent in Charlotte. Um, it was another, another business agent in one of the the uh, building trades mm -hmm. called the Princess. I forget right now who it was. We also met with Mr. Bean a couple of times on this industrial commission. Mr. Bean was very cooperative. And in fact, we got in and did some research over there. Art White went over there and they let him get into some files from me. And they compiled, Art White got some information that uh, I threw in the governor's face on that second visit over there. It just, the governor said this man had told him that he would be fair to everybody. And the law says there'd be one representing, not more than one, representing employees. It doesn't say you've got to have one, but not more than one, not more than one employee. Well, I had one employee down there, and we had it documented where he had testified before a legislative committee and said he was the employee representative. Well, we got this thing where this guy represented 37 different insurance companies, a man the governor appointed. He throwed it in the governor's face. Uh, in addition, we've gone through the files over there, which we weren't supposed to do, and we had seven cases in the last two years where they had represented employees and one where they represented an, an employee. So we, we told the governor, this looked like he was an employee, and I think that's why the governor said we could uh, appoint the next guy. Well, we had uh, lunch with Gail Barkin here in Sawyer one day, and as I said, we met with Tom Poole on manpower and the friendship training two, three other times. Uh, we had a real good, I thought, news conference here two weeks ago on this atomic energy thing in CP and L. We brought down a man from IBW, and I had invited a man from UAW to come down on Atomic Energy, and uh, the newspaper and TV coverage was extremely good on that. We had a half-hour programs on W, where we answered a, an attack on the labor movement on our march over WRAL, uh, Jesse Helms, and he's made another one, which he's got to answer now. And we 
had a half an hour program on WPTF and a 20 minute program on WKIX radio station here. Yeah, that's right. Jim went over and had what a two hour show at Shaw University yeah, on, the uh, on their radio program that covers all the neighborhood around Shaw University. Now, building funds, which is the cookbook. <laughs> you know, we got a suit against this on the cookbook. We've conferred with the attorney three times. Uh, a suit has been filed down in Brunswick County against this by one of the creditors which uh, was signed, uh, Lillard signed a, a letter that she would be next to the last one to be paid and she's going to court. We went down there, the lawyer recommended and we agreed for him to do it. He went down there and asked that they for, uh, put that case off until they could work it up where that would be brought into the other cases that are already pending here in Raleigh because they in essence were the same thing. So uh, we look for those cases to come up sometime in January and I want to say to those members of last year's board who are here, it is important that we have two or three board members ready for these court cases who can say that this man came in I was there and know that he did it also. Came in and rested, said in effect what Mr. Barbie said he said, that he would uh, underwrite these books and that the books would be paid for as sold. Now, in, in the testimony that Mr. Barbie given to a court reporter, this is his pick all the way through. In the testimony given by the man who printed the books, he said the agreement was that they would pay for the book. Now, naturally, there's somewhere there there's a clear, uh, clear uh, mistruth or untruth. But we can say what was said before the board, and that was that the meeting I was in that he would underwrite the first ten thousand of things. But he, he man's pretty smart. He went to Mr. Barber and he told Mr. Barber, "I'm in a bad jam here, and I need you to." say that you're buying these books so, uh, so I can buy the paper on the credit to print them and all. And, and Millard uh, just, in essence, in one paragraph said that uh, this is the value you or uh, that we are ordering 40,000 cookbooks and you don't say nothing about pay or anything else. And this is the letter the man dictated in for him, I imagine. But we signed it and we're not in as good a shape on these cookbooks as I thought we were. Uh, and because Millard has signed two or three letters that, that uh, I'm afraid that uh, we can be held directly responsible. I don't know where they're going to get the money because in my book they can't get it out of nothing but the general fund and they'll never have $40,000 in there, I don't think. Uh, but I think that I'm telling you this for three things. Number one, it's incumbent on us to show that we're trying to sell the cookbook so that when we go to court, we can show that we're pushing the cookbooks and trying our best. Now, mm -hmm. I've got in mind, and we've been doing so many other things, we haven't had a chance to do any of it. I've got in mind trying to sell some of the internationals in the food business. And there are seven of them, a, a page ad. He's got one page ad, and I thought he had two. Uh, I, I looked through one book, and I didn't see but one. Maybe the other one was left out. If the ad sold for a thousand dollars, I'd like to get about twenty-five ads so we could give the cookbooks away and get them out of our hair. And I'm working toward that goal. But we've got in the pitch here, and to about the fifty of the big unions, we've got in your pitch here a poster to go on your bulletin boards in your plant. Now, the big industrial unions, Virgil, we're sending you about 15 of them because I don't know how many bulletin boards you got. But I know the tobacco locals have got about 10 or 15. Uh, Bill and Trade locals, I'm not sending a great many of them because I know you, uh, you ain't got places to put them. But industrial unions, textiles, CWA, ILG, amalgamated clothing, and other things. We don't have any. No, I don't have any. We just, we just mailed them in one of your kits there. But we're mailing you some too. Here, pass them around so they can read them. We've got just a few more and we can run all you need. If you want a hand bill, we can do it. 
Okay. Let me, uh, while we're on this, let me just say now, we too have got, as you know, we've got the bill, the, the land uh, down here, and uh, Mr. Barbie had had a $75,000 offer for the land. We have now gotten up to $110,000 offered for the land. Uh, there are two or three people who I told we'd be meeting today, and I'd give them 10 minutes to come in here and talk about the proposal that they might have to us in regards to the land. And uh, I'd like for one of them is outside man, he's been a good friend of ours, and I, I'm going to break right here and let him come in for 10 minutes, and after all, all of them get through this afternoon, we'll discuss, the board can discuss that in executive session. This time, Bill, Bruce Toomey there. You and a Bruce, Bruce, you know Bruce real well. I'll let Bill introduce Bruce, because Bruce and Bill have been friends for a long time. Bruce, the sister, this gentleman here, uh, I've been a friend of the labor movement and certainly a friend of working people for a long time. He was active in the Clark Scott <coughs> campaign and the Clark Scott administration. He was active in the Terry Sanford campaign and the Terry Sanford administration. He's also been a friend of us and the state FLCIO and all working people for a long time, Mr. Bruce Poole. Bruce? Come on around, Bruce. Real estate. Actually, we bought the property from him, didn't we, Bill? Then I'm a little bit weak. I, I had some cold this morning. Marlene. Yes, go ahead. Now, Seth. Yes. I have been for when I had a text this morning. I sold you all that property. You know, whole about seven years ago, but when I see you, well, I'll give it to you. I'm glad you got it anyway. I want to buy it back. I made up the hobby a proposition. I don't know how you're going to feel about it. Ask permission to talk to you, too. What I intended to do, Mr. Hobby tells me he wants a building on Approximately how many feet, may I ask? Well, I, don't, I don't really know what we need right now. Well, I would content to say you need about 3,000 feet from what I've seen. Yeah, about by double or triple your space on what you got here. And you could add on this building, this particular building, you could add 30 feet span as you, as was necessary. I got I got 6.8 acres on the highway and I ask permission to tell you people what I think would like to do. I would like to trade you my land. I got a 420 foot of road frontage <coughs> on Highway 50, about six miles out of here. I want $65,000 for my property. I'll give you all 100000 I may can do better than that for yours. <coughs> if you all see fit, 
appoint somebody, or Mr. Hobby to appoint somebody, or you, I don't know how you all operate. I know I've always been your friend. But you appoint a committee or one or two or three people, so you can't deal with a group of people as long to save your life because I tried out the state college and University of North Carolina and everybody else has been So, I'll give you $100,000. Take 65 from mine, I'll give you a. Of course, I'd like to be paid for my transaction from yours because I'm an industrial real estate dealer, if you aren't pleased. I swear I don't get paid, I don't win. Anyway, that's entirely up to how y'all decide if you are interested in my proposition. And I'd like to leave this book, Mark Bruce Poole, underneath, and there's a building here, Reconstruction Company out here off of Wake Forest Road, exactly like this building, exactly. It's paneled inside like this. About half of it's paneled. It's beautifully furnished, air conditioned, heated, and everything. I think you can build that building for $60,000. I'm reasonably sure or less. I think I could put it on up for less than 60. But uh, the committee would, or Mr. Harvey, would go look at the reconstruction building. I don't think there's any question about it because I have an office in the branch bank building. I pay $5 a square foot for mine. But that Reconstruction building is just as nice as my office is. <laughs> and uh, I appreciate it if you considered it. We can't make a deal. That's one of the things that happens to me every day. I, and uh, I want to thank you for letting me come in and lay down and play just a few words to you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry I was late again. Looks like you hit it just about right, Bruce. <coughs> Got this hotel in a swap for the land out there named Kid Brewer. Some of you know him, some of you may know him. He sold off his property and they're gonna fix him to build and well, somebody says the largest shopping center in the South. I don't much believe it can be much bigger than North Hill, but, but it's going to be a big shopping center. They've almost got the land cleared. Those of you who came in on the Durham Highway, you know that big, big red right. area over there. That's uh, the land that's going to house this shopping center. Now, our piece of property is over on the left. Just as you cross the bridge, we've allowed some explorer scouts to sell Christmas trees there this, this Christmas <coughs> and they put some gravel on there and fixed the lot up a little bit and going to clean off all the underbrush for us and, and uh, we get a little public relations as well as out of the Boy Scouts uh, editor of the Progressive Farmer magazine which is the most liberal farm thing there is and none of them very liberal uh, is the scoutmaster for his troops so he's cleaning the land up for us and looking after us but we've had uh, <laughs> Mr. Poole and his two sons in the real estate business and all three good friends of ours. But right here, we're going we're gonna to look for the best business to them. We've got two gentlemen. One of them owns the apartment project right next to our land. Uh, they're not kin to each other, they say. They've got the same last name. I think the words that they're not kin to each other, because I don't know whether maybe it's different to us, whether they're kin or not. Named Bird. And they've made us a proposal. 
and I, I, my, let me tell you right now, my recommendation is going to be to the board today that we don't do anything at this meeting in regards to this land. Because number one, these people are putting pressure on me, and I don't know which is the best deal, and it, all of them want it, so I think we can get a good deal for it over with. So my recommendation is going to be to you uh, that we wait until the next board meeting, which I hope uh, we'll agree on here today, either be the 27th or 28th of February, because uh, we're going to set a weekend school here in this hotel for the 28th of February, uh, and I'm hoping we can combine it with the board meeting. But we've got what I consider was pretty good, and I think we can do better even from these people. We've got a downtown here. There's a piece of property which is two buildings, which are less than five years old, joined together. We have colored Polaroid pictures of you here. And uh, this proposal is only one page long. I'll read it to you, and then you can look at the picture. I like this deal here, with the exception, as I said, I think we can do better. Uh, and if we do do better, it might help us out in another phase, which I'll tell you about when I get through. Let me just read the description, then you can see the property. Property consists of one two-story bu office building and one one-story office building located at 710-712 West Johnson Street in Raleigh, North Carolina. The buildings are in excellent condition and are five to ten years old. They are attached and foundations for both buildings will an allow an additional floor to be added. <coughs> one to two-story building, the foundation allow you to go to three there. One to one-story building, and you can go to two there with the foundation. There are 3,538 square feet of rentable area in both buildings, not including corridors and baths. Pilot Life Insurance Company is the largest tenant and occupies 1,675 square feet with a monthly <coughs> rental of $450.34 per month. Four years remain on their lease to include an option. The entire monthly rent amounts to $965.34. If we bought the building, that's the space I want, and we can't get it for four years unless they decide to give up their option. Now, that's the one-story building you see there on the right of the picture. The property is financed for the first and second mortgage. The first mortgage has a balance of $44,000 with monthly payments of $489.95, including interest of 5 and 3 quarters percent. The second mortgage has a balance of $10,000 with annual payments of $1,000 plus. Since it's a six percent, no official appraisal has been made, but the owner's value of the property at approximately $110,000 and would not consider selling for less. Now, I hired somebody to come over, a man who didn't know anything about real estate, but who was a building contractor, and I asked him to give me an appraisal on what it would cost us to rebuild a building, or build a building like that today, and I didn't tell him what the figure I had here was at all. And he said, you couldn't build those buildings today, just the buildings, not counting the land for $115,000. Uh, which means that this property may be worth $135,000 or $140,000. Proposal. Subject to mutual agreement, the owners offer a proposal to exchange the above property for the property owned by the FLCIO on Highway 70 West in Raleigh, North Carolina, with no exchange of cash. That with no exchange of cash, is something that benefits both of us. And if we sold this property and we gained $100,000 on it, we would have to pay 25% in capital gains, which means we'd have taxed $25,000 to pay on our gains on this property. But if we swap it, as he proposes, he'll save and we'll save 25 grand. So that, that part of it makes it attractive too. Uh, both properties would be considered equal in value, and the FLCO would agree to accept the note and deed of trust on their property equal to the amount and at the same interest rate as exists on the above property <laughs> at the time of exchange. The owners of the above property would agree to make payments to the FLCO in amount that would at least equal the payments required to be made by them. Consideration would also be given to any kind of proposals made by FLCO whether involving the proposed exchange or cash sale. Well, they say right there in the last paragraph, this thing is still, they'll do better. As I said, I like this offer really. But then in 
Our second or third meeting with our attorneys on the cookbook was going through the assignments of money that Mr. Barbie paid to pay off uh, for what he owes the man in sales. And we run across the very next payment to be made is a payment of $16,000. This $16,000 is owed to one of the gentlemen who's making this proposal. So, uh, uh, Jim and I looked at each other when we noticed this, and we didn't know what in the hell is going on, you know. And uh, we thought there might be some hands of and I don't, I don't think they either. I think what, I think what probably has happened, although I got a, I talked to the other partner yesterday, and she said she don't know what it is, and so this man said he'd be many to call me. Because they think I'm mad at him because he's suing us, but he's not the one suing us. Somebody else is suing us. What I want to know is how in the hell he's got $16,000 coming from the guy we owe to the cookbook. And uh, I didn't get it out of him yesterday, but what I got in mind is we could get this $16,000, you know, knocked off of us on the cookbook. This deal here would become extremely attractive to me, I'll tell you right quick. And this is the angle that I want to work on a little bit. Uh, and I like the building. The building is a get, it's a paved, got a paved parking lot for 30 cars. Uh, we could actually build on to the second floor of that pilot life and move over there. Probably cost us $20,000 to add an additional floor on there. We could move over there and have more space than we got right now. And, uh, and have $965 a month rent coming in, which means we could have somewhere between ten and $12,000 a year income. Now, I'm sure the property may increase a little bit, but uh, I don't know whether it's going to keep increasing at the rate of ten to $12,000 a year now. Uh, that's what it's increased for the past 10 years, but I think somewhere...